Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Ad Tech webinar. My name is Chris Jeffrey. I'm standing in for Vin Banj, who would normally present these. He sends his apologies. He's traveling on client business. I'm joined by John David Bello, who's a senior associate in our London privacy team, and by David Klein, a partner in our Hamburg, Germany tech and privacy team. Um, for those who don't know, this is one of a series as part of our global data hub. You can find some excellent content and updates on privacy on our website. We are a European, Middle East, and Asian law firm focusing on helping clients, particularly in the technology, life sciences, and private wealth sectors. Our privacy team is 22 partners and 70, 70 lawyers uh, over four continents. So, so let's, let's crack on. Um, why ad tech and why now? Well, I guess a key, a, a key challenge when we look at um, GDPR and e-privacy is the online world and the complexity of some of the ecosystems and data sharing that, that happens. And probably ad tech, I think, is among, amongst the most complex and the most challenging. If we look at the number of platforms doing any number of different things with user data in order to show a relevant ad to an online user, the complexity is really quite breathtaking. And then GDPR pops up and says, wherever you're a data controller collecting user data, you need to explain it to people in a simple way so they can understand and so that they can, in, they can exercise their data protection rights. And that tension now, I think we're at a really interesting time where we are starting to get guidance and enforcement from the European regulators that is giving us, I think, an initial sense of what their expectations, what their expectations will be. At the same time, um, ad tech is getting into smart TVs, into billboards, into wearables. Um, here in the U.S., I'm sitting in Menlo Park in California. Um, the Californian legislation will come into force on the 1st of January, their first attempt at a, a kind of global privacy law, and other states are starting to follow suit. We have industry attempts, the IAB transparency and consent framework, which is an industry standard attempting to achieve the consent and transparency that, that GDPR pushes for. So just a really interesting time. And of course, an ecosystem which, as we all know, is critical to the internet as we know it. Um, I saw a prediction the other day that online advertising will be worth 280 billion US dollars in 2020, dwarfing TV advertising. And of course, ad tech and the ecosystem behind it supports a large amount of those content and the, the online services that we, all, that we all use. So let's crack on. I'm going to speak to the developments in, in the UK. And we had, on the 20th of June, our ICO. Um, published its report on real-time bidding. Um, we haven't time in this webinar to get into the technical detail, but in case any of you are not really familiar with the details of ad tech, real-time bidding is a technique which involves the sharing of personal data relating to a user when they arrive on a website or an app with a large number of ad tech platforms. And there is a live real-time auction where ultimately the advertisers and the intermediaries that they use will bid to show their ad to that user and the highest bidder wins. And I think the RTB, you know, the ICO has chosen RTB because it is the most complex area in terms of data sharing within ad tech. So what have the ICO done? Well, in some cases, it's classic ICO. Um, they have a reputation for being a fairly pragmatic regulator. And here they are being quite clear in their approach. They're explaining what they are worried about. They are indicating they, an understanding of the importance of the ecosystem to the online world. There are hints they're not going to start immediate enforcement, a review in six months' time. 
nice positive noises about engagement with the IAB and with Google and the industry more broadly, but at the same time, some real fire in the belly. I think the ICO is flexing its muscles here and has some, some parts of the report are quite scathing in their assessment of where ad tech sits in terms of privacy, in privacy compliance. And, and that's probably, I think, consistent with the ICO starting to enforce in a slightly firmer and more aggressive way than perhaps we've been used to. Certainly British Airways and Marriott would, would I think, agree with that. So what, have, what are the ICO what are the ICOs saying? Well, they, they've found significant areas of, of non-compliance. They've, they've been that blunt about it. They've found in some parts of the ecosystem a real lack of understanding of GDPR and de-privacy. Some people not understanding what a lawful basis is or just ignoring its requirements. There's a statement, in some ways perhaps the most concerning of all to the ecosystem, that the sharing of profiles on users that's inherent to real-time bidding is disproportionate, intrusive, and unfair. And we'll come to what companies may do in practice about that, because that is a fundamental part of how ad tech works, that, that widespread sharing, the thinking of cookies, etc. And there's a there's a call to data controllers in the industry to reevaluate their approach to their privacy notices, to their use of data, to the lawful bases they they apply. So I think quite a clear expectation, and a key takeaway we'll come to later in practice is is we need to be seen to have reacted to this report, to have digested it, and to have done something as a result. So even if you feel as a business that your GDPR preparedness was actually pretty good and you're involved in ad tech as a platform or as a publisher, I think you need, do need to go back and at least internally reassess in the light of the report um, and be seen to have reacted in some, in some way. Now, there have been some misgivings amongst the industry about the level of engagement to date, I think it's fair to say, and the report is very, very high level because, of course, there's thousands of companies involved in RTB doing very different things with different categories of data. And necessarily, the report itself is hugely high level. So it may not be quite as cataclysmic as it might appear for everyone in the ecosystem. So a bit more detail. What have they found that they didn't like and what, what can we do about it? Poor awareness and understanding of GDPR. Uh, there's some really good practice amongst some, particularly of the larger ad tech companies, I think, of the impact led by the IAB often. But they found also some shallow awareness. They found platforms signing up to the IAB framework, for instance, without really taking the trouble to understand what that meant. They just threw the fr framework to the techies and said, go and implement this. They haven't, in other words, taken full responsibility under the accountability principle to really understand what they're doing with data and what that means for them. There's a, a slightly strange section in the report focusing on special categories of data, particularly related to health. The ICO seems to think there's quite widespread use of user segments, you know, users with diabetes perhaps to sell, uh, to sell drugs or medicines for, for diabetes management. Um, and, and our sense is actually the industry doesn't use these very widely at all. Uh, so perhaps a key thing for platforms and publishers to check is to verify that you're not using these special categories. If you do, of course, there's a much higher bar for compliance, and it's quite hard, I think, to see how you would do that in a way that would keep the ICO happy. So we're hoping that through further industry engagement, that issue will, will basically go off the table, but we'll see. Um, the real crux of it for me, and where over time there will be change, I think, is, is around lawful basis in the interplay with, with e-privacy. Quick step back, as all, as, as all of you know, where you're a data controller processing personal data under GDPR, you need a lawful basis. You need a justification to have that data in the first place. The two candidates of the six that GDPR allows, in ad tech, it's really either consent or legitimate interests. Now, the 
The industry and many publishers have looked at consent and thought that is very hard to achieve. It's an intrusive user experience. It needs a very positive, affirmative action. It needs to be capable of being withdrawn at every time. However you look at consent, it's actually quite tough to achieve and to manage on an ongoing basis. Whereas legitimate interests, although I think people have underestimated it, is probably a little bit easier, certainly from a user experience perspective. And so a lot of people in ad tech and on the publishing side have pinned their hopes on legitimate interests and the the balancing exercise that involves where you say, I've got a legitimate interest to generate ad revenue or to provide ad tech services to my clients. And I am balancing that with the interests of the user by ensuring they understand what's happening, they can exercise their opt-out rights, that it's always pseudonymized data, we don't mix it with real world data, etc. You do that whole balancing test. The ICO has come out really clearly here and said that for the targeting element of real-time bidding, where you're using user data to work out if you wish to bid to show your ad, or your client's ad to that particular user, that that can only be based on consent. And they said, in fact, that the nature of the processing within RTB makes it impossible to meet the legitimate interest lawful basis requirement. So that's really quite, that's really quite strong. Now, again, there's an awful lot going on in ad tech, which is not the actual targeting of the ad using user-related data. There's measurement, how, how many people clicked on the ad, how many people saw the ad. There's attribution, to what extent did the ad lead to a sale, for instance, or a sign-up. There's uh, anti-fraud measures and there's security. For those, it's possible, I think, the, the report doesn't hit it head on, I think it's still possible that legitimate interests will fly. But there's a real challenge there to the industry that the, the regulators, and David will talk about where the German regulators are going in a similar vein, that for the core targeting element in ad tech, the regulators are pushing quite hard for consent. The ICO also has also said, uh, we talk about e-privacy and what we loosely call the cookies rules, that because you need a consent and a GDPR level of consent for an advertising cookie or to access um, uh, uh, an advertising ID on a mobile device, you need to use consent as your GDPR lawful basis as well. So, you know, we're being squeezed by the ICO to, to look very carefully at using consent for targeting. We don't expect there to be a lemming-like rush by companies who are not currently using consent but are using legitimate interests, but it will be really interesting to see where this lands. But my own prediction would be over the next 12 months where you see a minority of websites and apps currently using consent and you know those notices we're all familiar with that block out most of the screen and make you make some selections and choices that we'll see a lot more of that but it'll take a while I think for this to really for, for this to really set off so moving 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 quickly through the other objections we saw have been around um, about the, the lack of transparency. Now, this is an easier win. And I always think when you get a report like this from the regulators, let's at least take the low-hanging fruit and get the easy wins. They found that privacy policies, publishers and platforms alike, don't really explain in a clear enough way what's happening to data. So, you, you know, link to YouTube videos from the IAB that explain ad tech or a nice narrative example that makes sense in the user's world. I think there's an awful lot more the industry can often do to make their privacy policies really understood. One of my colleagues uses the test of the moderately intelligent 14-year-old with all respect to any teenagers on the, on, the, on the webinar and I think that's a really good test. Walk them through almost as if you were chatting over a cup of tea in a, in a cafe with them. So they really understand what's happening and not enough of us are doing that at the moment. Um, what, another challenge the ICO has thrown down is around over-reliance on contracts. So of course, with multiple parties seeing the data in relation to a particular ad impression, contracts govern those relationships. 
And by and large, although there's some very good practice in the industry, a lot of people simply get a compliance warranty or if it's control as a processor of the Article 28 assurances. And the ICO is saying, no, you need to do more. You need to take responsibility. You need to do an element of due diligence. Are these appropriate people for you to be sharing data with? And then to assess their compliance on an ongoing basis. So if you don't do that at the moment, you know, questionnaires, calls, perhaps audits and inspections of major, par uh, major partners down the line. It's a tough one to get right, but I do think you need to be seen to have something along those, along those lines in your program. It's tough, of course, because it's a double-edged sword. If you look under uh, stones to try and find stuff, you might find something you don't like, and then you can't pretend that you haven't seen it, and there needs to be a process you go through, perhaps in a really extreme case that may involve even no longer working with a partner. So a, a challenging one. DPIAs, um, the ICO is very clear that these data protection impact assessments, those detailed analysis of how your processing fits in with GDPR, need to be done by ad tech platforms. And I think they're probably right. Um, so if a DPIA is not yet in place, then I think that's a key takeaway. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean changing your lawful basis or upending your your business model or any threat to revenue. It's part of that internal documentation. Um, but I do think it's um, it's something that needs to be that needs to be focused on. And then just to finish quickly on the UK position. Um, just last week, we've had the revised cookie guidance from the ICO. As many of you will know, the UK is perhaps the regulator that's focused most on cookies historically. And I think the takeaway here from an ad tech perspective is, again, this is part of the general regulator push towards consent. Because the ICO is crystal clear that you know, wherever the e-privacy regulation lands in a year or two or three years, whenever it's finalized, the law as it stands at the moment requires a GDPR level of consent for ad-related cookies. They're absolutely not in that category of strictly necessary where you just need to be transparent. You need a GDPR level of consent, so that intrusive UX. They are saying you shouldn't drop cookies that need a consent until the consent has been obtained. And they're also being crystal clear, although I think industry will be reluctant to follow this, and it'll be interesting to see how it, how it plays out. Um, they're also pushing that, that if, you, if a user doesn't consent to ad-related cookies or uh, the use of IDFAs or device fingerprinting, whatever it might be that's used in order to identify that user, or ad targeting purposes, if they don't consent, they still need to be able to access an ad-free version of the service. And that's what the shot across the bows the ICO gave to the Washington Post um, a few months back confirmed. In a way, that's the toughest and the real sting in the tail. So again, what we're expecting to see, I think, in the UK is a gradual move towards consent from the UK-based companies and those for whom the UK regulator is maybe not their lead supervisory authority with Brexit looming, but, but where it's a key market, we'll think, I think people will start to use consent more broadly, and I think we'll start to see it in the UK in the app world as well, where at the moment there's really precious little, generally, there's precious little by way of real transparency or consent um, from a privacy perspective. Um, and there, there's the ICO site, just on the next slide. You can see what they've done there very quickly. That's their cookie notice, analytics cookies. They don't use ad-related cookies, being the ICO, um, but analytics cookies requires a consent. They're not strictly necessary, however bizarre that may sound. So that's toggled to off. So here's what the regulator's doing on their own site, just to give you a sense. So enforcement. Well, we think they may start to enforce. They've made some 
comforting sounds that if you're just using first party cookies you strictly need consent you don't quite get it but you're transparent you know reading between the lines maybe will will give you a little bit of slack but i think the key message is here this needs to be engaged with and reacted to an awful lot of clients focused on the uk market enhanced transparencies from a cookie and a data perspective but didn't really embrace some of them have but a lot of them didn't embrace consent as such so there you are, that's the UK position um, and handing over to Jean-David for the French developments. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, we can now cross the channel or the Atlantic, depending on, on, on where you are, and focus on the latest developments in the ad tech industry in France. Well, the, the French teleportation regulator, the CNIL, um, who has made ad tech a priority for 2019, has been fairly active last year in terms of enforcement against ad tech companies. The CNIL issued notices against Timo, FeedsUp, Victory, and SignalSpot, which are marketing platform um, uh, providers. All cases have not been closed, but we go through the issue at stake um, in those cases, which in a way actually um, reflect what Chris just um, described in the IC report. So I'm, I'm not going to go through the details of each case, but in a nutshell, all of them were found to have failed to get valid consent to the processing of geolocation data for profiling and targeted advertising. So what did they do? Well, they, they provide location-based marketing solutions using a software development kit called SDK, uh, integrated into publishers' applications. And at the time uh, of the CNIL notices, users downloading an app with the SDKs would see a pop-up asking whether users consented to the app collecting their location data. And so the issue though, is, is, is that um, the pop-up did not specify that the location data would be used, one, for, for profiling and advertising purposes, and two, that uh, it will be shared with um, third parties. So the, the CNIL um, carried out some investigations for some of them in 2017. Um, and I'm going to, again, summarize the issues in, into one slide here. So the CNIL found that one processing of geolocation data constitutes a particular risk to data subject. And in the Timo decision, the CNIL even said that um, processing of geolocation data constitutes uh, an intrusive form uh, of, of uh, processing of data which could harm individual um, um, freedoms, um, especially because companies which use it uh, can permanently follow and in real time data subjects in public and private um, a space. And, and that notion of a, a private life um, has been mentioned in every single case. The second point that the CNIL mentioned, but again more specifically in the TMO case, was the, the volume of that data subject involved. Um, in the TMO case, uh, they collected data every five minutes, which roughly amounted to 1,600,000 advertising ID collected and matched which with um, geolocation data over one day. The, the main issue was, was consent, um, and, and the CNIL said, again, in every case, that consent was not valid under the GDPR because it was, one, not informed, um, and in fact it was collected after the app had been downloaded and the collection of location data had already started. Not freely given. Uh, users were not able to download the apps without the SDKs and had no choice but to give consent in order to continue using the app. So here the, the CNILs found that uh, consent was not um, freely given. The other point on consent is that the CNIL found that consent was not specific enough. Um, and when he looked at the pop-ups, um, it did say that the pop-up did not set out the specific purposes of the processing. And as I said earlier, I did not mention the fact that uh, the data would be passed on to third parties. 
So there are really the, the key points on consent that the, the CNIL focused on um, in each case. Um, again, very specific to, to one decision, the TIMO decision, um, or the TIMO notice, um, it, it, the, the data re retention point. And it's something that, that the CNIL wanted TIMO to have a look at later on, uh, because TIMO argued that um, they would keep the data for the duration of the contractual relationship with the user, but the CNIL said, well, you don't have any contract with the user, so the retention period that you have set out doesn't really work. Um, the, the, the other retention period that Timo had put in place was um, a 13 month period that they had um, uh, arbitrarily chosen, um, arguing that some of the partners may need the, the data, and the CNIL said, you can't do that, you need to have a proper re retention policy in place uh, to make sure that you keep the data for as long as you need it. Another point as well, which again was specific to a Timo case, um, is, um, is that um, Timo had no uh, confidentiality and security clause with one of their uh, third-party providers, and, and, and that contract did not specify um, that, 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 that the provider should act upon the instructions of the controller, i.e. Timo. So what, what the CNIL did in, in every single notice is that they provided a series of measures uh, to each business to comply with, and they gave them three months to comply with the measures. The first measure that um, the CNIL wanted the businesses to implement was that, as Chris mentioned earlier, the, the lawful basis is one of the key requirements under the GDPR, and they all have to find a lawful basis for processing geolocation data for profiling purposes, and that lawful basis is, is consent. And clearly gave them an, an example of how this can be achieved, and they used the example of the pop-up and a dedicated tick box. Um, I mentioned the security and confidentiality clause, so the CNIL um, uh, asked the, 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 um, the controller to insert a clause um, providing information about the security and the role of the controller as well. Um, in relation to the data retention data, the CNIL asked um, TIMO to, to, de to define a retention period and also to delete any data which had been obtained with a valid consent, and that was the case in the Victory and the Feeds of Care as well. Um, one point to note, though, is, is that uh, Victory, um, at the time of the investigation of the CNIL, uh, was not part uh, or did not take part of the AIB framework at the time. So all these measures had to be implemented within three months, and so uh, most, if not all, of the companies have implemented the, the measures, and, and so the publishers using SDK um, had to seek valid GDPR consent prior to any collection of personal data. They had to review their banners as well and to include what I mentioned earlier, which is uh, that the banners have to be presented at the time of collection of personal data and not after the app has been downloaded inform the, the users of the purposes of the data collection, uh, i.e. specifically and, and expressly mention uh, that, that, that the data is going to be used for targeted advertising and profiling purposes that is based on geolocation and that it will be shared with third parties as well. Um, the, 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 they also um, implemented uh, some, some links and, and, and listed the, the controllers who will have uh, access to data as well. And, and I'm, as I mentioned earlier, there were issues around the, the retention, uh, which meant that the, the provider had to set out their retention policy very, very clearly and, and also comply with all the, the requirements of Article uh, 13 and 14 of the GDPR. What, what I found useful is that um, the CNIL has developed two, two tools for developers, one very specific to SDK, and, and um, a, a few weeks ago, the CNIL announced that 
it has to be some guidance which is very specific to developers, which I think is very useful because in addition to setting out the measure that they expect controllers to, do, to implement, um, to, 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 to comply with, uh, with their obligations under the GDPR, they also provided some technical support for developers. So have a look at it. Uh, it's in French, uh, but uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to come and see us and, and we'll be happy to have a discussion with you about it. There is um, another CNIL decision, which is more recent this time. It's um, the Google decision. So some of you may think that it's not directly related to, to our tech, but actually it's very, very relevant to what we, we, we discussed earlier in relation to uh, information, transparency, and consent. So back in January of this year, the CNIL issued its first GDPR fine against Google with a 50 million euro fine for various breaches of the GDPR, responding to complaints made in May 2018 by privacy campaigners groups about the use of targeted advertising in the context of its Android operating system. Again here, I'm only going to focus on transparency and consent findings because there are all the um, other issues that 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 uh, Neil raised, but I'm not going to focus on them today. So, on the basis of its inspections, Neil concluded that Google did not comply with the transparency and information requirements of, of the GDPR in relation to its privacy policy for uh, Android. The first finding that the CNIL made was that, one, it was too difficult for users to understand what Google was doing with their data, and the purposes of the processing were not described in sufficient detail. By way of example, um, the CNIL stated that information provided was found to be difficult to access, and I quote, um, uh, excessive dissemination of the information is one of the findings of the CNIL. And they did mention the fact that it requires too many steps, um, at least five steps, uh, while not providing coherent or, or, or seem that the CNIL wanted to see information in a single place about geotracking and targeted advertising. On the information point, the CNIL also criticized the architecture of the privacy policy presented by Google and mentioned that there were too many links uh, in, uh, in, in, in the document. On the consent point, uh, the CNIL found that the consent was not valid, that Google did not obtain valid consent to targeted advertising because individuals were not given um, sufficient information so for consent to be informed, and, and the consent was not um, specific enough. One of the main critics, actually, was that general consent was required to sign up, but the consent to receive targeted ads was not on the main sign-up page and was pre -ticked. This meant that um, consent was neither specific, because um, a general consent was the default type of consent, no, an ambiguous because the fact that the consent to targeted ads was predicted meant that they, there was no unambiguous consent by clear affirmative action as required by the GDPR. What is also interesting um, in, in this case, in my view, is that Google appears to have uh, been criticized for not making all uh, its privacy information available in one place, but it also seems to have followed the Article 29 Working Party's recommendation to use granularity to help users through the process of understanding what happens to their personal data. So really, this confirms the tension between presenting information in a way which ensures the intentions are read up front and making sure that individuals have all the required information, and particularly when relying on consent. So really, the, the, the takeaway um, from this decision um, is, is that transparency 
and information uh, are key requirements. And um, it's, it's difficult to have a perfect privacy policy, but as Chris mentioned earlier, you should take the 14-year-old test. I think that that's a really good indicator uh, for you to be able to, to, to uh, present a privacy policy which is coherent and, and, and which is clear enough and, um, and which doesn't bring you to, to, to several places as well. So the, this applies to, to this case, but also to all sectors of the ad tech ecosystem and um, is especially relevant when, when it comes to identify third party data, which is one of the main issues in the ad tech um, ecosystem. So one takeaway is that consent must be by um, affirmative action and that practice boxes will not be su sufficient. This is not new, but it was uh, an occasion for the community to, remember, to remind us of it. Uh, the emphasis is placed on linking processing operations to specific purposes and explaining what is meant by legitimate interest in sufficient detail for the individual to understand. And obviously, there will be the documentation that you will have in place internally, which is going to be um, more detailed than what you will put in your privacy policy, but you still have to mention uh, why you believe that legitimate interest should be used for a specific purpose in your privacy policy. So what we know now is that Google has appealed the fine, saying that it worked hard to create a GDPR consent process for targeted advertising, um, which is as transparent um, as possible. So the, the, appeal, the appeal will be heard by the Conseil d'État, uh, which is uh, the highest um, uh, uh, public court in France, which may refer um, the question to the CGU. So what is this space? So I mentioned at the, at the beginning of, 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 uh, of this talk that ad tech was one of the priorities for the CNIL this year. And um, what, what they have done uh, last week is that they have described um, the, the action plan uh, in relation to profiling in advertising. So the first action is that they are going to publish new guidelines uh, this, uh, this month. So we're expecting the guidelines to be published last week, but they haven't. So uh, they're likely to be published um, this week, if not by the end of this month. Um, so what they say basically is that the 2013 guidance on cookies is not applicable, of course, because the GDPR is not in force. Um, but most importantly, the CNIL said that there will be a transition period of 12 months that will be given to businesses to comply. Um, and the, the CNIL did say that they will continue to, um, to investigate um, 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 any, any, any non-compliance uh, with, uh, with the current rules anyway. The second action that the CNIL has described is that they're going to launch a consultation with, with industry professionals on methods of collecting consent. And we, we know that uh, the community is already talking to uh, some of you and, 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 and some actors in, um, in the tech industry. And, and so what is, what is the community going to do is that they're going to have some sessions to discuss. Um, in the same way as the ICO does it, uh, with the fact-finding forum, and they're going to discuss a very practical method of implementing consent, which I think is a good initiative which should be um, uh, welcomed. And again, the recommendations will be published by the end of 2019, uh, probably in December of this year, and um, the CNIL will check compliance with the recommendations six months after their publication. So expect from June 2020, uh, some, um, some you know, uh, investigations by the CNIL. Just very briefly, um, Chris earlier uh, presented the, um, the cookie banner on the ICO's website, where the CNIL updated their approach to cookies. They're going to eat in French, but they, they don't have any banner, actually, but, but uh, you have to go and click to, uh, to the cookies link of the website to see how they manage uh, cookies.
and, and the way they have done it is they also eyes, um, or, or you can also eyes, or, or so that you don't want um, specific cookies for, for all the services or for uh, social media or videos. So with further ado, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, to hand over to my colleague David, who is going to um, talk about what's happening uh, in Germany. Thanks, John David. Um, let's see what the German view is. Um, I think um, Germany is very famous there for being a little bit more strict in terms of data privacy than probably other European countries. Um, and in the past, um, to be honest, targeting and advertising, online advertising, was not on top of uh, the list of the German authorities. They focused more on issues like um, employee data privacy issues or data protection in terms of um, companies and internal compliance. So um, what happened now is just before, um, let's say, we started with GDPR, there have been some developments in Germany. Okay, first, um, probably some background, because uh, I think in Germany it's a little bit special on, on the legal side what is going on. Um, firstly, the good news is there's no case law in Germany for RTB or similar um, complex attack products, so um, there was some case law or is some case law concerning uh, the use of Google Analytics um, and Facebook custom audiences, but only for Facebook custom audiences um, with uh, customer emails. And um, both mechanisms require consent and, of course, a proper information of the data subjects. So there is no surprise from the German side. Um, the other case law in Germany actually concerning transparency, in particular concerning privacy policies of all the big players with, uh, which have been challenged before the courts, came from consumer protection societies. So they took over um, the enforcement of privacy laws in Germany um, instead of the data protection authorities in the past. Um, under GDPR, there is actually um, no ruling from the um, Federal Supreme Court so far, so we are expecting this um, coming up in one of the next cases, but um, at the moment, again, there is no case law. The legal framework, actually, for targeting um, is not fully clear in, in Germany. The background is that we have, under the um, Directive um, 546, um, a specific framework for online services. Um, and PECR was actually, that is the um, opinion of the German lawmaker, transposed in those Telemedia Act, which deals with the online um, data processing or data processing concerning online services, while everyone else <laughs> actually says, no, it was not transposed. So we have a lack of transpo uh, transposition of the uh, PECR in Germany. Um, and the thing is that the Telemedia Act allows actually um, opt out for non-personalized ad tracking, so pseudonymized ad tracking. Otherwise, consent is required, that says the law, so everyone actually uh, try to base those advertising on um, the exception in Section 15 of the Telemedia Act. Now, the authority says that GDPR is exclusively applic applicable on uh, targeting, and this is the joint approach of the German authorities, by the way. So what happened? Um, yeah, I think in red, <laughs> it's already the message um, that I wanted to uh, present in this um, webinar, that the enforcement has already started in Germany um, concerning tracking and data protection on the, the GDPR. There's a position paper from April last year, which was really a few days uh, published before GDPR was uh, coming into force. So um, this came quite surprisingly. It was a very short paper that had some um, major points concerning tracking and data protection. So this was not binding, actually, for the court. It's just the opinion of the um, authorities. And the interesting part in Germany also is they, um, the DPAs do not distinguish between tracking for targeting or tracking for analytics. Everything is tracking, actually, and they just decide on the legal basis or on the question um, which legal basis will apply 
depending on the data processing activity that is um, going on with respect to the targeting. So in that paper, they already mentioned that GDPR will apply exclusively on targeting and um, for everything that deals with user behavior and building of user profiles, consent is required. Um, following uh, that first statement last year, to be honest, nothing happened, uh, actually. And the next thing coming up was a guideline from April this year. It was quite long, actually. Um, I don't know how long it was, uh, 30 pages or so, concerning, again, um, targeting and tracking um, online. And again, it's not binding, and it specifies the position paper from April, April last year and made clear GDPR applies. We actually, on tracking um, consent, um, performance of a contract and legitimate interest might apply. Um, please keep in mind that tracking means also analytics. And I think the most important part is that the authorities also mentioned a step process test for balancing um, the legitimate interest. So um, firstly, to make clear that consent does not mean opt-out, so it's a clear opt-in required. I think that's uh, common sense. And um, the first point here requires full information for data subjects, including third parties receiving data. This is something that is very challenging under German law because um, actually we had already under the um, directive information requirements in Germany, which have been enforced actually also. So there was always the requirement to inform the data subjects very clear on what's going on. So uh, it's not only about which data we collect, which, uh, for which purposes we use data. You had always to show the direct connection between both. Makes it a little bit more complicated for the 14-year-old to understand actually. That's really a problem. Um, cookies should not be dropped before consent is given but not all cookies require consent. So um, there's some uncertainty about um, this guidance, actually. Um, it is to be understood that if you have to drop a, co a cookie that requires consent, you have to collect the consent. Um, the three-step process for the legitimate interest, I think that's the interesting part, is um, drafted here. So you need always a case-by-case -case assessment. So you need it for any of your tracking mechanisms separately on your website. You can't just say, I use website or online tracking, and this is my legitimate interest test. You have to do it for any of your tracking mechanisms and for any of your user groups. So in the first place, of course, you need a legitimate interest, which is direct marketing, actually. And this processing or that legitimate interest must be necessary for the purpose of the interest for uh, actually the direct marketing. It's not sufficient just to have a legitimate interest. The authority said it must be necessary. So this um, makes it already complicated or challenging in terms of how your processing activity in this uh, regard is built and how it works. Afterwards, you have to balance the legitimate interest, of course, with the interest of the rights of the data subjects. And um, they deal already with some of the expectations, which is cited in the GDPR as well, about uh, the tracking. And the authorities say that tracking is usually not expected by data subjects. To be honest, um, I think most of the data subjects are aware that some kind of tracking happens. And uh, the authorities also say that it does not help if you have a privacy policy which is clear and transparent, shows that tracking happens on your website. You can't use that knowledge on um, actually the um, legitimate interest balancing test. So um, this, I think, um, summarizes very well this legitimate interest uh, test, how the authorities expect the compliance with the legal basis test on uh, the website of a publisher, how it works. And they also pointed out that in most cases, consent is required, as I said, for most of the tracking mechanisms, in particular for the more complicated, all the challenges that already Chris and uh, Jean-David uh, Jean um, mentioned concerning transparency. So this is 
in summary, the um, German view. So I hand over again to um, I think Chris. Thanks, David. Um, so key key takeaways. There's a there's a lot going on. The we're in the foothills of regulator enforcement and and guidance, and I don't think it's yet clear where a lot of this is going is going to land. So what are what are the key takeaways? What are the practical recommendations that businesses can do? Well, the first thing is quite basic is actually read the guidance. Certainly the the UK ad tech report and the German April guidance are worth reading just to get a sense of where the regulators are going and how it fits in with your with your businesses. Um, over the next two to three months, I think we see ad tech companies and publishers in different positions on this. Some are absolutely engaged and all over these issues. They're engaged in industry groups, whether it's the IAB or others, um, and they know exactly where, where they're, what their positioning is and where it's going. Others, I think it's fair to say, could do with refocusing on this. There are companies who you know, quite understandably did their GDPR preparedness, sometimes making some very robust prioritization calls, and are now doing other stuff. Perhaps they're US headquartered and understandably focused on the CCPA and trying to work out what that's going to mean for their models. I think for those guys, although it's in some ways it's the worst time to be pulled back into European privacy issues, it probably needs to be done because things are going to start changing and it will be certainly within a year I think we'll see some more significant enforcement and, and maybe before that on ad tech. So it does need some 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 refocusing. Um, I think there's some internal stuff that can be done and we touched on this before. To look again at the calls that were made around lawful basis and around transparency, around user rights, and to look at in the context of the guidance we've had now, is what we did back in say May 2018 just good enough to get us to get us over the line at that time? And actually now we have the full expectations of the regulators who are generally being actually quite strict in how they're applying the rules even to a challenging ecosystem like ad tech. It, it's very likely that an upgrade an upgrade will be will be needed and I think in all three countries we'd be pushing for that and generally across Europe for that for that matter. So for, there's some easy internal wins if you like where you can control stuff without I think um, upsetting a business model or you know radically changing UX or the lawful basis you choose on the IAB framework whatever it is and that is looking at privacy policies that is looking at your engagement with the industry if you're and I know the the framework is not everyone's cup of tea I actually think it's an excellent development will be pushed forward and probably needs to be pushed forward but I'd encourage people who aren't involved at least to have a look at that and get involved in those industry discussions we talked about DPIAs I think that's a must-have if you're doing ad tech it will be something I expect regulators will ask for. Of course, they'll ask for your record of processing activities, Article 30, Record 2. But the DPIA is where you will actually walk through why you think the way you're doing it and the lawful basis you're using is compliant. And I think that, you know, within a year, definitely, maybe within six months, not to have a decent um, DPIA. And I think the, the trick is often to start with something that's good enough and improve it rather than to go all out for perfection in you know in a year or 18 months time i think it's important to get those dpias in, in in place around the really tougher stuff whether there's a change in lawful basis and i do get we're completely sensitive to how controversial this is we're quite aware of how many publishers in germany and other countries including in the uk have have stuck quite strongly and firmly to legitimate interests so any suggestion that that needs to be reconsidered will not be welcomed in some quarters. But I think with with all three sets of regulators pushing for consent, I think that at least needs to be thought about. And where you think you're going to stick to your guns on legitimate interests, I would use the German regulator guidance that David talked about across Europe. It's the most detailed walkthrough of what a legitimate interest analysis involves that we've had from any regulator. So I would use that as a as a framework and a benchmark and make sure you've really 
you at least show if the regulators come knocking, you've thought really carefully about why you think legitimate interest works in your um, for your business, even if ultimately the regulator disagrees, showing your homework and your thinking and how you've taken it seriously always, always helps. And we talked about looking at the vendor and partner chain and where, where you essentially rely or ask a couple of questions around privacy. But if they, you know, if if a relationship with a new partner or a new ad tech platform makes sense from a commercial perspective, you sign the contract with the reps of compliance and then you basically move on and get the relationship moving to think that there needs to be some more sophisticated questions and due diligence um, around that would seem to be, uh, would, would seem to be sensible, sensible to me. In terms of where this goes, it's really hard to call we we know we we have a good sense now of what the regulators are expecting we've seen that push for consent but where this lands and to the extent to which the industry moves towards it and how in practice whether there'll be slack around some of this issue, um i think remains to be seen so there is a sense in which you wouldn't want to rush to rehash lawful basis and move to consent and push it out and then actually find that the regulators want something even more than that so I think it's still a case, as it always has been with privacy, seeing what everyone else is doing, talking to your peers, engaging, um, and trying to stick in there with the pack. I think the pack will need to move on a number of these issues, so you need to move with them. But that 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 would be that would be my sense of of, uh, of the best steps to take. David, from a German perspective, is there anything that you would add that you'd like to see companies who are, say, based in Germany or very targeted on the German market doing? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I think, um, in addition, probably interesting is that the German authorities mentioned that they want to get clearance before the courts on, in particular, the legal basis uh, for targeting. So they mentioned that they will probably find prohibition orders. So we are already um, seeing that the um, authorities are collecting information by information requests. It's a formal request under GDPR. Um, but they mentioned probably a prohibition order, but likely no fines in the first step until the courts have cleared that. So this is probably interesting. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, interesting. And very, we're, we're nearly up against time. There was a lot to get to, but thanks, John David and, and David, for 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 taking us through <clears throat> we've got a question around I'm going to look at the questions that have come through oh, actually Jean David do you want to do the polling let's do the polling if we have time in a couple of minutes that'll be interesting yes yeah, so, so we're going to do these uh, our, our usual polling questions we've got three questions but maybe we can um, run through one question just in the interest of time and the first question that, that we have is a uh, do you think that your organization is cookie compliant? Um, so you should be able to answer yes, uh, A, um, or no, B, and C, we are waiting for the privacy regulation to be adopted. So we'll give you some time to, um, to respond and, and we'll give you the results of, of the poll uh, when we have them. And then one of the questions we've got is whether you need consent to specific cookies or or whether you can get consent for categories of cookies. And I think the answer is you can get consent for categories of cookies, but you should probably give information on all the cookies that are dropped. I think that latter bit is, you know, there's still the requirement for clear and comprehensive information under the e-privacy regulation and PECA, the UK implementation of it, that, that you should tell people what cookies are dropped. The ICA doesn't say that you need that table of specific companies, but they say it, cookies rather, but they say it's one way of presenting the information. But you should also talk about the retention of those cookies as well. I, I think the other thing I would say around cookie consent is how limited those strictly necessary cookies are. So we know that authentication, security, streaming, network management, user preference can be strictly necessary. But everything else seems to need a consent, social media tracking, online advertising, and, and, and cross-device tracking. And so I think in answer to that question, you'd get consent to categories of cookies, and the consent management platforms have, I think, some sensible categories. You know, um, 
be uh, measurement and analytics, for instance, um, ad tracking, social media plugins, you know, those kind of things I think are the kind of categories that we'll see people getting consent for. Thank you for your, your question. And that leaves us bang up against time. I hope that's been useful. Um, thank you for attending, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.